You know the Kermit the Frog in uh, The Muppets? He has a great line. He says, I always knew what I wanted to be even before my tail fell off. And even when I was a, a little tadpole, I knew John Facenda was here to say, this was your destiny. I was an art major, so I like to do assemblages and mixed medias. People look at them and they see a lot of these different things and, I, and they say, well, what is this? And I said, well, it's a self-portrait. So they say every artist's work is an expression of himself, so instead of a title sometimes, I say, well, it's, it's a self-portrait. In some ways, they represent the game of football, which is a sort of a rush of jumbled images and chaos, and yet there's some order in the game of football. But to me, they're more self-portraits. When I think of the word icon, I think of historic, unique, and there's no one that would encapsulate those two qualities more than Stephen Douglas Sable. I know that Johnny Unitas was an icon, Dan Marino uh, was an icon. For those that really know football and understand that there was a visionary behind creating these icons, and that was Steve Sable, in my opinion, that makes Steve Sable an icon. Long before this building, which grew out of this man and his camera, inspired by so many of his canvases, Steve Sable was a boy in love with a game. You're looking at an unusual story here and a person in myself who can go back and remember the sights and sounds and smells of the first time I ever put on a football uniform. I remember being in fourth grade, and I can still remember uh, the feel of the leather pads on my shoulders and the way they smelled. And I can still remember the sound of the cleat marks made on the cement as we walked out onto the field. When you, you put on the, the uniform, it transformed you into a warrior. You put the black under your eyes, taping yourself up and, and going out there and knowing that there was going to be physical combat. I mean. I was caught up in that ever since I was a little kid. From the moment he put on the pads, Steve Sable was hooked on football. But away from the field, Sable was captured by films. When he wasn't poring over his playbook, his eyes were drawn to the screen. After football practice, nobody would ever come home, and my mother would have apple cider and, and ginger cookies, and I'd be there by myself, and they'd say, yeah, I've got a Sables, you're not gonna see American Bands, and you're gonna be stuck with those old victory at sea. But they made such an impression on me. From the battleship Missouri, the word was flash. Cease fire, cease fire. The war is over. Equal to his love of football and film was his passion for art. It was an appreciation passed down from his mother, Audrey. My mother ran an art gallery in Philadelphia, and she was the first person to recognize the value of what was then called pop art. Robert Rauschenberg, Jasper Johns, Roy Lichtenstein, Wayne Tebow, Ed Ruscha, the artist that she would have in her gallery would come to our house for dinner. To me, seeing somebody that had a box of Brillo pads and calling it art, or someone that was just painting an American flag, that all of a sudden really fascinated me. It made an enormous impression on me as, as a young kid growing up. 
That's what I wanted to major in when I went to college. I was one of those guys that in the end, you know, in your yearbook, there was like 70 lists, cum laude society, signet society, speaking content, all that. I was second in my class, and they told me, coming from Harvard School, well, you can go any place you want. So I applied to Harvard. I didn't do well on my college boards, and I got a letter back, you know, thanks, but no thanks, you're on the waiting list. You know, it was a huge embarrassment. So there I was in the middle of the summer, no place to go. You know, I was voted most likely to succeed in the yearbook. Couldn't get into college. So that summer, my mother put my name into this college admissions center. So all summer, I would be getting, well, you've been accepted at North Dakota State Spearfish Teachers College. You've been accepted at TCU. You're accepted at University of Miami. Then I got this thing. You were accepted at Colorado College. And the first thing that came to my mind was Dutch Clark. He was a Hall of Fame football player, played for the Lions, that went played at Colorado College. And I said, well, that sounds sort of neat. And then I saw a picture of the mountains, and I said, that's where I'm going to go. Colorado College, what a great school, I loved it. I was a running back, but I also punted, I kicked. I was all conference, led the nation in punting for, for about two weeks. Coach Parcells coached against me when I was in, in Colorado College. That's a true story. It is. Legitimately a true story, 1964. Right. Steve was the, uh, I, I don't want to say tailback, because that, but, that would imply that he had speed. <laughs> I, he was the guy that they used to carry the ball. <laughs> Average six yards a carry against it, your I defense. Think it was, so. I think it was 4.1 rounded off to 5 0. <laughs> now, I don't know what school of economics. Because I was, I was also that. in the public relations department, too. Know, it was a small I, school. I, to me, I took my talent as far as I could. And I, I think the, the, one of the proudest moments of my life was when I was elected captain of the football team at Colorado College. That, that meant more to me at th that time than anything else I'd ever done. Lifted weights for a whole year. I went from 165 to 205. Did a lot of banana milkshakes, boy. Steve was drawn to sports and spectacle. Not unlike his father, Ed who decades before everyone with a cell phone became an amateur videographer, fancied himself a bona fide filmmaker. My dad had gotten a 16 millimeter Bell and Howell movie camera as a wedding present. And my dad loved making movies so much that I, one of my memories of him were mostly of these uh, a body and a camera. I never remember seeing much of his face because everything I did, he covered on film. My first pony ride, my first haircut, my first football game. He filmed every football game that I played in from the time I was in fourth grade until the time I was a senior in high school. And at that point, my dad, who was an overcoat salesman, decided that he wanted to turn his hobby into his profession. He quit the overcoat business and founded a film company. We called it Blair Motion Pictures. And he decided that uh, he'd had the most experience filming my football games. That's what he wanted to film. The big game between the New York Giants, winners of the Eastern Conference, and the Packers of Green Bay, rulers in the West. In 1961, he found out that the film rights for the NFL championship game had been sold to the highest bidder for $1,500. And in 1962, he bid $3,000, which was double the previous year's bid for the rights for the NFL championship game, and he won. And that night, I got a call from my father, and I always remember this phone call. He said, you know, I can see by your grades that all you've been doing out there is playing football and going to the movies. But that makes you uniquely qualified for this profession. So I left school over the Christmas holidays and help my dad film and edit the 1962 championship game. You know, all of a sudden we're doing the championship game and oh, wow, this is a business. 
when I look back and I think of the way we started, it was just four or five people, young, young guys who loved to make movies and loved pro football and wanted to convey our love of the game to our audience. At the beginning, you know, we had the confidence of ignorance, is that nobody had ever done any of this before, so we made a lot of mistakes. Growing pains aside, Ed Sable sold NFL Commissioner Pete Rozelle on the NFL buying Blair Motion Pictures, and NFL Films was born. The whole company was just my father's personality, and the fact that the owners liked him. Yeah, there's this guy from Philly, he's a great guy. He saw, it was his personality that kept us afloat. So it took us about two or three years to develop the style If, if your father hadn't started this company, what do you think you what do you think you would have been? I would have tried to be an artist, definitely. I mean, that was, that's what I was interested in. Being a, a loft someplace in Greenwich Village. His ability to tell stories as an artist well exceeded just the movie making. Steve got into making these collages the kind of collage that you might make when you were a kid. You're gonna cut stuff out, you're gonna paste it all on there. Steve turned it into an art form. He could see things that would relate in, in the most unique way. I believe in, in artwork being a unity of opposites. It's taking a lot of different things and then putting together in, in some sort of a whole. When you think of making a film, you're really making a, a collage. You're taking bits of film and matching those film to music, to script, to sound effects. So there is a corollary between the two. We started NFL Films. I wanted to show the game the way I had experienced it as a player. Uh, and to me, it was, you know, eyeballs bulging, uh, sweat spraying, snot flying, you know, veins, it, it, football is a very visceral, passionate sport. And when you play it, those images to me seemed so memorable and they seemed to be in slow motion to me as a player that when we started NFL Films, I wanted to see if, if I could convey my same feeling when I played to the audience, those same images. And the best way to do that was slow motion, but slow motion was expensive because you'd, you know, you'd use up a lot of film. Slow motion was worth every penny. As Ed Sable used to say, selling overcoats, you remember the quality long after you forget the price. shoot a telephoto lens, see the faces of the players. There's nothing more dramatic in movies than the human face. Show the line of scrimmage with the fingers twitching. There's a whole story there. Uh, they want this well, you got the flight. one coverage. And then, of course, there was sound. You got the long uh, shotgun microphones. We got them closer to the bench. Come on, offense, take it to them. All right, woo! Come on, baby. Big play, baby, come on! So then we said, hey, maybe if we put a mic on one of the players. Nobody had ever heard what a tackle sounded like before. <laughs> so then we put a mic on a coach. Uh, that would be, that would convey the sense of passion and the visceral nature of the sport. Get out of bounds, Speedy. Out of bounds, you stupid guy! They're killing me, Whitey, they're killing me! My mouth at 20, you couldn't cover me. <laughs> it gave you a, an insight and a look into the game 
that you couldn't get anywhere else. And again, that was part of our credo, to show you parts of the game that you wouldn't see anywhere else. I'm mic'd up. You're mic'd up? Oh, yeah. Shut up. No, I am. They're going to have it. It's, it, they're gonna, it, it, was, it, it was It was better than Desperate Housewives. <laughs> Listen, there's a lot of people that want access, right? But uh, not everybody's going to get it. And, and the reason that NFL Films got access was because of Steve Sable. I know all the times that I was asked to get mic'd up, Always my first reaction was, you know, it's a, it's a big game today, knowing that I'm mic'd up, knowing that I have to think about what I'm going to say, what other players might say to me. It's just going to be a distraction. And all that was el eliminated once I got to know Steve that nothing that a player says to me that might be embarrassing for that player, it's never going to be heard. It's never going to be shown. He was going to protect the integrity of the game because of how much he loved football, how much he cared about the game. When I was in art school, one of the things that I learned, my art teacher used to say that composition is the blending together of unequal parts. And I always think that's interesting to take as many different things and see if you can construct something that's sort of pleasing to the eye or tells the story. I think my, my background in art affected my ability to make football films. It gave me an appreciation for, for color and form and structure and, and composition. Steve found artistry in the images. He was a cameraman who had this unique eye. Cezanne said that all art is selected detail. And when we started NFL Films, that was something that I thought was missing in all sports cinematography. To me, I wanted to get the storytelling shots of the way the, the, the sun came through the stadium, the cleat marks in the mud, the, the, the bloody hands of a player. That was what I shot as a cameraman. We had other cameramen who were great action photographers. But to me, I wanted to get those little details that, that, that added onto the action would, would, would flesh out the story. I start to work on a piece. You start in one direction, and then you add something, and then that changes the whole feeling. And then you take it off and you add something else, and that takes you in a different direction. Now, music is one of the most fascinating elements of filmmaking. When you think about it, music plays a, a vital part in our everyday life. We get married to music. We get buried to music. We make love to music. We go to war to music. Music hits us directly at the gut level, and we respond to it instinctively. When you saw football highlights, the music used to be the John Philip Sousa. And to me, it wasn't in touch with the game the way I felt it should be displayed. It was a game for our time. It was a sport that reflected our society. And, that, and you're here you're using music that went back to the 30s. And when we, we started NFL Films, both Dad and I felt you need, we need our own music. Dad found this guy, Sam Spence. He was an arranger. Sam lived in Germany. So I would get a little tape recorder and tape my thoughts on the tape recorder and then play examples of the music. And then Sam would add his own creativity, his own flourishes. And then we had all these different types of music. We're ready for another session, Sam. Hey, wonderful. And listen, I got some ideas, and as usual, I'll be sending you a tape, and you'll hear in this tape the way these trumpets come in, and I think this is Goosebump City here. to hear this style of music used in sports films. It was really unique at the time. One of the things that I've always believed about, it's important to make in movies, and I also think it's true of art, is you gotta get a good beginning and a good ending and get them as close together as possible. So I'm a big believer in brevity. 
And I like to be able to tell a story, like in six words or less, that's sort of a challenge. So I came up with this particular phrase, whiskey, my vice, so was he. That's the title. And this is Bobby Lane, a notorious womanizer and boozer. Words should be treated like medicine. If they're carefully measured and carefully prescribed, they can work wonders. But an overdose can be fatal. When it came to script writing, every word had to have meaning. You couldn't just blow off a line like a segue. No, every line mattered for Steve Sable. You know, before we started, old football films were uh, written like, Milt Plum pegs a peach of a past to become the apple of Coach George Wilson's eye. Third year man, Milt Plum pitches a peach of a past to Preston Carpenter on the Pittsburgh 20. That's not the way I want to write. To me, this was football was, was life and death. It was the fate of the universe was at stake. And that's when I started to realize if I was ever going to take NFL films where it wanted to go, where, where I wanted to take it, I'd have to learn how to, how to write. I'd read things, I'd copy them down, I'd take note cards, put things together. I think Steve Sable was definitely um, a poet of football. Lombardi. A certain magic still lingers in the very name. The autumn wind is a pirate, blustering in from sea. With a rollicking song, he sweeps along, swaggering boisterously. When we started, one of the things that I really wanted to do, and Dad agreed, is that we didn't want to have the usual sports. We didn't want to have Chris Shankle or Kurt Gett, who were great, but we wanted somebody different. Hello there, I'm John Facenda. When I heard John Facenda, I said, that's the man I want to read, that, that I want to read my words. John Facenda was the Walter Cronkite of, of Philadelphia. Before you go any okay. further than that, on page two, can I change a word here? Yeah. Uh, I like your alliteration, as always, but uh, can I use the word frightfully rather than... Uh, Frighting for Lily? <laughs> I'm going to have trouble with that yeah, one. Yeah, that is. That's a, that's a tough word. Okay, that's fine, because we still keep the alliteration. And okay. it's a good line, and I don't want to change it. Okay, thoughts. so it's okay. frightfully instead of frighteningly. I'm glad you said it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right from the very first play, Super Bowl XII was a coach's nightmare. It was fiercely fought, but frightfully flawed. To this day, I remember he narrated the first film I ever wrote. It was called They Call It Pro Football. And I sat in the studio with him and tapped him on the shoulder, and he had his script like that, and he read my first lines. It, it starts, starts with, with a whistle, whistle and ends, and ends with, with a with gun. gun. 60 minutes of close in action from kickoff to touchdown. This is pro football. The sport of our time. And I get chills when I hear that because, and my dad was, and we looked at each other, and it was one of those moments, the Eureka, this is, this is going to be different. This is going to work. This is the part of the game rarely seen by the spectator the shattering impact of a block. They call it pro football. That, to me, that was the Citizen Kane right, right there. That's when Facenda came together, the right. sound, the music. And Pete Rosell saw that film the next day, he called us and he said, I want you to come up to my office. And Dad and I went up to his office, this was 1967. And he sat there and he says, you know, that wasn't a highlight film, that was a real movie. I really enjoyed it. And he said, I want to show you something. He pulled a piece of paper out of his desk. And he said, this is a Nielsen ratings. Number one is baseball. Number two is, is college football. And here's the National Football League. And he said that in order for the National Football League to flourish, we have to succeed on television. And in order to succeed on television, we need an image. And what I saw yesterday is the kind of image that we want to project. Steve understood first and foremost the impact and power of storytelling. And the ability to tell stories in the most memorable way. Steve wanted to make you feel something. And if you felt anything, any of the range of emotions after you saw a story that he produced, then he succeeded. So if someone were to ask me how would I define our job at NFL Films, I'd say it is to bring a new understanding and a new perspective to something that's already been seen, uh, to give a creative treatment to reality. Yeah, the beauty of, of Steve and NFL Films was that he could take a scenario where maybe things weren't 
that great or positive and make it into a beautiful story. The Saints teams that my dad played on weren't, weren't the best of teams, but when Steve put together a highlight, it looked like he was undefeated as a quarterback, and the Saints were winning, and he was winning every single game. Quarterback Archie Mack, the heart and soul of the New Orleans Saints. Obviously, that was my dad. That made me feel good, and I think Steve did that for a lot of people and a lot of fans. The art of storytelling was something Sable mastered while at Colorado College. I went out there, and I didn't have a scholarship or anything, and I just knew that, you know, if you say you're, you're from Philadelphia, you know, that's not gonna cut it. So I, I told the coaches that I was from Possum Trot, Mississippi, because you figure, you know, that's where all the great football players are. Either that or like Coal Town Township, Pennsylvania. They couldn't figure out why I didn't have a Southern accent, but it did sort of catch the, the coach's eye. I was also in charge of the program, so I had an ad. It said, the, the Possum Trot Chamber of Commerce wishes its favorite son, Sudden Death Sable, a successful season. I gave myself a nickname. Sudden Death was my initials, Steve, Stephen Douglas Sable. So I just figured that'll, that'll, be, that'll catch the name, Sudden Death Sable. And although far-fetched, the legend of Sudden Death Sable proved far-reaching. Sports Illustrated had a really funny article about that. They came out for, for two days, and they, they spent a whole, you know, a uh, homecoming with me and everything. As a kid, when I go to the movies on a Sunday, this is what you'd see in the movies. You would always see something from World War II, a cliffhanger and then something in sports. When we started, part of our philosophy was to uh, present professional football the same way that Hollywood presents fiction, and that is with a certain uh, dramatic flair. I think of Duel in the Sun and that famous scene climbing up this mountain, and it's all done in close-ups. Why couldn't you do that in pro football, in the line play? The sweat and the, and the emotion of the faces. And I would see A Man and a Woman by Claude Lelouch was the director, and saw certain things in that and wanted to transfer that into football. Eventually, it was Tinseltown that was taking cues from Sable. Super Bowl three. When it came out, it was on television, I got like three or four letters from, from editors in Hollywood saying this is really interesting. And then I learned later that Sam Peckinpah had seen it and used it as a, a template for the end of the Wild Bunch. To say that we had some little impact as a filmmaker and, and you hear something like that, the fact that they're even watching, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's really exciting. Oh, quite a bit to Steve Sable. Montage, edit technique, combination of fast shots and slow shots that created this, um, this art form, to me, makes him a badass filmmaker. We're myth makers and we're romanticists. Hey, baby, let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs and have some fun. Let's go! When we started NFL films, the NFL had a tradition, but it didn't have a mythology. And I think that's what we have helped to create. Hey, fellas, this is what you work all off season for. This is why you lift all them weights. This is why you do all that. Rush the quarterback. That'll hey, cool your ass off. I like this kind of party. 65 toss power crap. That might pop wide open, Rats. Running play to Garrett on a trap. I tell you, they think it's there. I've always strived for those moments that you get chills or goosebumps. Looking, he's under the gun. He's 
Party from... He caught it! He caught it! Roger, he's going long. Down the near sideline for Drew Pearson. Pearson makes the catch at the five. Touchdown! The immaculate reception. The ball is pulled in by Frank O'Hare. The catch. Montana rolling out the right. Caught by Clark! The drive. The throw. Touchdown! 98 and a half yard drive. Those are all things now that live on collective memory in our film. And, and again, you're saying that, that we influenced Hollywood, but I was influenced by Picasso. Again, that's what I studied. The influence that I had was from, was from art. We're taking a single image and looking at it from multiple perspectives and for multiple moments in time. You're looking at it from the end zone. You're looking at it from the ground. You're looking at 48 frames. You're looking at 32 frames. If you think about this, what we're doing is fracturing time and space. And this is essentially the same technique that Pablo Picasso and George Brock, the famous Cubist painters of the 1930s, used. Now, they did it with a woman's face or a bowl of fruit. We're using a post pattern or a draw play. The creative force behind NFL film since its inception, Sable was forced to expand his skill set in the 1980s. When ESPN started, our on-camera host was Pat Summerall. Hi, I'm Pat Summerall, your host for the world of pro football. And when we decided to do a series for ESPN, of course, I went to, to Pat and said, you know, could you do the on-camera? I said, well, okay, but then found out that CBS wouldn't let them be part of this little stinky network, it's ESPN, well, we don't want you on that. So we were a week before going on the air, and Steve Bornstein, who was running ESPN at the time, said, look, You've been writing this stuff for him. And I said, yeah. And so Steve said, well, look, you go on camera and you do it. And I said, but you know, I, I've never done anything like this before. And Steve told me, he said, well, he said, don't worry about it because nobody's going to be watching anyway. This is going to be good. I can see this. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Steve Sable of NFL Films. I'm Steve Sable of NFL Films. I'm Steve Sable of NFL Films. And I feel very privileged to be part of all this. You talk about going on with no pressure. I mean, I figured if the president of the network's telling me, ah, don't worry about it, nobody's going to be watching anyway in the beginning. So it was a very easy way to start. Steve was such a natural when he moved on camera. He was just enough of a ham. The Raiders play the Chiefs. And this is certainly a rivalry that, Hank, you have to be familiar with. Last weekend was the second highest scoring weekend in NFL history. Tackling is when a guy has just robbed your house and is running down the street with everything you own, and you're trying to stop him. Just had a way of making whatever he was saying memorable, and a lot of times it could have been because what he was wearing. Where's your costume? <laughs> All week long, you were telling me you had this great costume, and now you chickened out. Well, I don't believe I it. I changed my mind. The subject of our first Ah, uh, but where's your Halloween spirit? <laughs> Our first story is about an offensive lineman who played for the 49ers in the 50s. Well, let me say this about that. And so suddenly, Steve, who I think was very happy being behind the camera and just making his movies and sitting in his darkened room, all of a sudden, he became almost as big as the players or the coaches that, that he was interviewing. But I don't think he ever set out to do that. I think Steve almost unwittingly became the face of the NFL. I'm like Haley's Comet. I just come around at the beginning of your career. You win a Super Bowl. Just on the good so And you might see me again when you get into the Hall of Fame. I like it. So, so like cherish it. this experience. I do. Don't worry. I do. All right. It was special to have Steve Sable coming down to interview me. Steve had documented Johnny Unitas and Roger Stallback and all these players. The fact that Steve was now doing that with me, that certainly meant a lot. I'm honored that Steven Spielberg would come out of his busy day to interview me. Uh -huh. yeah. hey, but you ain't answer the question, where all the money? There is no money. The money's been spent. You ain't doing it on your wardrobe. I know it isn't. You ain't doing it on your wardrobe. Let me tell you. No one, no one, Steve Zabel, wants to be called Steve Sable. 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 At least you, you know, well, so we've we known each say. other for 30 years. Well, At least you could get my well, name. You brought up the bad, you brought up the dumb thing. Marion Motley? Who in the heck is that? You don't know who Marion Motley is? Molly crew? I've always been. So switched. you're still upset about the first question? Yes, I, I am. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Tom Brady, poor build, 
That might be accurate. <laughs> I would probably agree. <laughs> Is that surprising? Sable's interviews extended beyond the NFL. You know, football and golf are just not snobs to one another. We wanted to. You ever been to a Super Bowl? I've been to every one. <laughs> yeah, come on, I hope we got that on camera. <laughs> when you think about Lombardi, um, the, let me just get a. I lost my train. I thought your answer was so good. That uh, does this ever happen to you when you're doing an interview? No. You just you know. <laughs> Steve could get anybody to talk about anything. What are the duties of the piss boy? What does he smell like? Were you under any medication? I mean, we go with a snowball. Uh, you ever get hit with a meat pie? That might be worse than an ice ball. It's getting hit by a meat pie. You could have those direct, personal conversations with Steve Sable. Jim, if you had to go back and look over your life, is there one broken friendship? That you you would like to repair. Well, that's a that's a deep that's a deep uh, question. Well, I give you the real honest answer. My mother. No one got more out of the goat than Sable. How you doing? Well, thanks for doing this. I know. Thanks for doing this. Happy to do it. Thanks for coming out. All right. I came up specially for this. Coach Belichick I, said, Steve never goes anywhere. I, I don't. I'm retired. <laughs> you brought me out of retirement for really? this, so you better be good. I'll I'm, try. We're, we're depending on you. I'll this try. is, have a seat and let's roll. And it was hard. I remember taking a walk with my dad and mom around the block. What'd your dad say to you? It was just a tough day, you know? I just remember being there with my mom and dad. Sorry about that. And thank God I got, I got picked here. Do you know oh, the <laughs> Oh, man. We did it. Thanks, Steve. All right, I, I appreciate really appreciate it. you doing this for us. Yeah, I know you're, this is busy, but I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have uh, sent that to you unless it was really important. Yeah. But thanks for you. Now, like I, I said, you know, hey, I love everything well, that you guys do and you've done. I well, I, I, we don't want to abuse a relationship. That's why. And I, when I... No one knew at the time that it would be Steve's last interview. Live on NFL Network, uh, reporting news that uh, none of us can believe. Um, Steve Sable, a president of NFL Films, has passed away due to complications from a brain tumor. It is beyond belief that this weekend's games, week three of the 2012 season, will be the first in over half a century in which Steve Sable will not be with us to enjoy. Once again, Steve Sable has passed away at the age of 69. I'm standing in the NFL Films Library. There's 6,000 miles of film in here. I've shot some of it, edited a lot of it, and seen all of it. At the NFL Films Production Facility in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, Steve Sable's parking spot remains reserved. And his office intact. You could still walk in his office and really still get a sense of Steve Sable. It's like he's still here. Nearly a decade since his passing, his spirit and legacy live on in the building and company he helped create from the ground up. And as his films and artwork have been preserved, so has the culture he created. I just want to make sure that everybody at NFL Films who comes to work enjoys coming to work. And they, they get up out of their bed and they come to work and they say, great, I'm not, this is going to be a great day. I believe that you let each person here develop his own way of expressing himself. There's no rules. And I think that's really important. I think that's. One of the things that I'm proudest of is the environment that we have here. At NFL Films, the hours are flexible and the attire casual. Creatives are free to make their space their own. 
It's a very sort of loose atmosphere here. But everybody that worked for Steve knew what it meant to be a professional because Steve typified that. Sable's emphasis was always on the art of filmmaking and where his influence is still felt the most. His artistic vision is as much a part of today's NFL Films productions as it was back in 1962. Steve's influence is seen everywhere in everything that Films has done, but how could it not be? This is what he built. This is what he created. These are the standards that he set. This is the bar that he raised to a ridiculously high level. And while NFL Films content is seen by more people and in more places than ever before, the same concepts the company pioneered in the 1960s are still used today. This is our sixth Super Bowl. And I think when you talk about competition in sports, we have competition in NFL films too. We've got to be better than we've ever been. We've got to make this one our best effort ever. I think when you look at our coverage, oddly enough, our coverage really hasn't changed. And I think we have a certain classic style of filming the sport. And although the players and the personalities change, our way of filming them, our way of covering them, really hasn't. The president of NFL Films personally won 35 Emmys. That is more than anyone in television history. He joins his father, Ed, as the third father-son duo elected in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, along with the Roonies and the Maris. So it is time to celebrate the life and legacy of Steve Sable with his induction into the Hall of Fame with his wife, Penny, and good friend and former Kansas City Chiefs GM, Carl Peterson. Please reveal the bust. In 2020, Steve Sable was elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. It was a fitting reward for a man who transformed so many football lives into art. Nothing lasts unless it can be expressed in terms of the human spirit. And I think in some way, with our music, our pictures, and our script, we are expressing that human spirit through the sport of football. It's unique in the sport that people can look at a Gale Sayers run, a Barry Sanders run, a Dan Marino spiral over and over and over. Steve Sable definitely ignited a passion uh, for fans throughout generations in football by telling the stories. Lance Allworth, Deacon Jones, he preserved the legacy of all those players. You hear a lot about filmmaking uh, being an art form, and I've heard uh, so many directors and photographers referred to as artists. Well, I believe that an artist is anyone who takes pride in doing his job well. This is one of the biggest cliches that exists. But if you asked Steve, he would tell you he never worked a day in his life. Because making movies, telling stories wasn't work to him. It was part of his being. I think that everybody in life might have a certain destiny. And when I look back in my life, I just figured that this was my destiny, to do this job, to make these films. And I don't think I could have been doing anything else. But I just feel so lucky that everything sort of came together, that I had the visionary father, the mother who was an artist, and then all of a sudden, you know, a lifelong love affair with a sport, and here you are, the rest of your life is all you have to do is express your love of this sport in a medium that you've, that you've always loved as well. 